True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Brandon Tina was a female to male transgender person born into really a homophobic culture. As we discuss Brandon's life growing up in rural Nebraska in the 1970s and 80s, it's really difficult to conceive of the difficulties that he faced. Looking back, you can see how his life spiraled out of control as he did attempt to navigate relationships and endured some abuse, a lot of judgment, and a lot of disapproval. Join us at the quiet end today for what we hope will be an insightful look at the struggles of a young transgender person and the hate crime that took his life in Boys Do Cry, the Brandon Tina story. So we're going to drink a nice Nebraska beer. This one is from Empyrean Brewing Company in Lincoln, and it's called Dark Side Vanilla Porter. So it's an American porter, fairly low ABV of 5.7%. Beer is black with a tiny tan head. There's a very nice chocolate aroma and a very subtle vanilla aroma. The taste is cocoa and vanilla, and the the vanilla is much more apparent in the taste. This is a medium-bodied beer, easy drinking, and enjoyable. All right, sounds good. Yeah, so we're going to open it, but we're not going to take it to the quiet end today. No, the quiet end is closed. We're not going out. We are under quarantine, sort of, self-imposed quarantine, because of the coronavirus. And we thought it would be kind of irresponsible for us to be out and around uh, with a bunch of people. Kind of. It would be totally irresponsible. So we are home. Which we really encourage all of you to do, aside from any necessary job you might have to do, or if you have to get medicine or food. But for the most part, we encourage everyone to stay home and listen to podcasts. Ours, preferably. Yes, we have a lot of them. You know, and just just saying that we do have a premium show as well, if you run out. But we also want to stress trying to keep a distance from people, isolate, stay, stay away from folks, reduce the spread, and obviously wash your hands. If you're sick, for sure, don't be out and around. I mean, just common sense stuff, right? Well, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of younger people who think that they're fine to just do whatever, which really annoys me, right? Because they can get older people sick. And plus, we just heard this morning that a doctor who was about 40 years old died of this. So you're not immune just because you're young. No, you're not. And if you're old like me, you're less immune. That's right. So nobody's coming near Dickie. My protector. Okay, well, that's enough of that. I don't want to be preachy about it. So let's go ahead and start our story. This is a very interesting story. I have to tell you, I learned a lot from it. I was pretty ignorant about a lot of these things, like I think a lot of people are. Well, I think that's one of the problems with this. Yeah, that's why I think it was a good recommendation. This episode was recommended to us by Jerry, who found it fascinating, and we have too. So why don't you start our story here, Dick? Okay. So Tina Renee Brandon was born in 1972 in Lincoln, Nebraska. Oh, can I just add here, I forgot to say that through this whole story, we're going to be referring to Tina Renee Brandon, Brandon Tina, with the pronoun he, just out of respect for what we think he wanted in his life. That's all. Go ahead. Brandon was the younger of two daughters born to Joanne and Patrick Brandon. Joanne had her first daughter when she was only 13 years old. When Brandon was born, she was all of 16. Tina's father died in an alcohol-related car accident just before Tina was born. It was a difficult pregnancy. Joanne ended up on antibiotics for staph infection, and she wasn't allowed to hold Tina for the first five days. 
But you know, the thing here is, what do you think about bonding between Joanne and Tina? First of all, she's 16. There's a lot of stress going on. She already has another child. And right. then she has this illness and doesn't really get to bond with the baby in the first few days. Do you think that that's a problem? That is a problem or potentially a problem. Plus the other one is that the father died in a car accident. So he never met his father. Right. And that's just more stress on mom. Right. And Joanne didn't have the best upbringing, right? She had grown up in Lincoln and her father deserted the family when she was just seven years old. Her mom never got the child support that he owed her, but she was barely able to get by by doing some work as a bookkeeper. And Tina was frequently sick in childhood. He had bronchitis and pneumonia at 15 months old. And it seemed like he had a fever, a cold, or a flu just about every month, according to Joanne. When he was in the second grade, Tina got mononucleosis, too. So that was a long period of recovery. Yeah, that can take a while to get good full recovery. And you feel like absolute crap when you have it. Yes, it can be a tough one. So Joanne raised her two daughters alone in a mobile home park. And she supported them by working as a retail clerk. When Tina was three and her, their big sister Tammy was six, Joanne remarried. This was in 1975. Unfortunately, that marriage wasn't the greatest, and Joanne and that husband were divorced uh, five years into the marriage. Yeah, and then Joanne really wasn't in love with her second husband, who was named Jug. He was badly in love with her, I guess, and bought her a lot of gifts, and he was very good with her children. But he was the kind of guy who became especially possessive of Joanne. His friends would come around and they would hit on her and Jug would blame her just because she was polite to them. But, you know, he was a good stepfather and that was the main reason that she was with him. Yeah, she was looking for some stability with her kids, right? Yeah, I would think that's reasonable. Now, Tina called Jug daddy and he was the only father Tina had known. When Jug and Joanne first got divorced, they remained friends, and Tina and Tammy visited them often. Over time, though, Tina and Tammy just didn't get along with Jug's new wife. And it came down to Joanne telling Jug it was the girls or his new wife. And Jug chose his wife. Yeah, so I don't really think that was a fair choice to give him in any way. He's married to this woman. And I think that her daughters were really benefiting from the relationship with him. It seems they were. Yeah, probably would have worked better. I mean, it seems like his new wife was jealous of Joanne, who was kind of younger, and he'd always been madly in love with Joanne. So I'm sure that bothered her a bit. But it seemed like Joanne was just a little bit overly quick to sever that relationship. Of course, she was very young still. But losing this father figure was devastating to Tina. He never wanted to acknowledge his existence after that and refused to talk to him. Joanne was supporting herself and her children at that point with the social security money they received after her first husband's death. And eventually they moved into a trailer with their grandmother. So that wasn't the best. Very crowded. <laughs> For sure. Now, Tina was described as a tomboy, but he did have boyfriends when he was in school. Tina wasn't as interested in boys as Tammy was, but he had kissed a boy and pointed out boys he thought were cute. So at least at this point, in his preteen years, he was... Uh, interested in boys. Interested in boys. Not right. as much as most girls, but somewhat, yeah. Tina was a good student, and Joanne paid attention to her daughter's progress in school. They both attended a Catholic elementary school, and this was the same school that Joanne had attended. Joanne liked the structure and the strong ethical code at the school. And she also wanted the kids to follow the religious teachings of the school. So when Tina was 12 years old, his best friend was a girl named Sarah Gap. Sarah confided in Tina, telling him about her religious fanatic mother, who kept an altar in their living room, and would actually beat Sarah and her siblings for very minor infractions. So Sarah felt that her mother didn't love her because she often told her she was worthless and was even calling her a slut at 12 years old. So she doesn't seem like a great mom. <laughs> no, not exactly. And Tina told Sarah that she wasn't alone with these difficulties. 
She confided that a male relative had molested Tina and her sister Tammy for several years. So Tina and Sarah became very close. At the time, Tina didn't want anyone to know about the incestuous sexual abuse that she had endured. He didn't want the man to be angry with him, and he didn't want the man to get into trouble. Tina said he still loved this relative. Now, the following year, Sarah and Tina began high school together. Now, this school, the high school, is located in a wealthier area of Lincoln and is surrounded by big houses with really beautifully landscaped yards. Tina didn't like to wear dresses. For his school uniform, he wore pants and a tie, looking more like boys than the girls. Now, Joanne never talked to her daughters about sex, condoms, or periods. So Tina was kind of surprised when he started having a period. He was so upset and couldn't believe he'd have to go through this every month. Right. But still, he didn't do anything that would seem abnormal. He seemed like a normal girl. He wore girls' underwear and bras. But he never wanted to get pregnant or give birth. He thought that was gross. He did want to adopt children, though. The high school they were in was very strict, and Tina became pretty rebellious. As a prank, he once took all of the toilet seats out of the restrooms. And in 1989, when Tina was a sophomore, he had a part-time job at McDonald's. Now, he didn't like the job, but it did provide some spending money. And at this time, Joanne had moved a new boyfriend into the house. His name was Mike, and he fought with Joanne, so it seemed like a very unhealthy relationship. And alcohol was very much involved, so this couple was off and on, it made the household very uncomfortable to be in. Well, and this, this is a story we hear time and time again. Poverty, poor education, young motherhood, young being a parent. I mean, it's just stuff that's uh, setting you up for failure. It's definitely a tough thing to overcome. Tammy moved out of the house, and she became involved with an abusive man. Well, I mean, that's all she really knew, right? She yeah. grew up with that. I mean, what? <laughs> Tammy got pregnant and decided to have her daughter adopted. And the baby was adopted by a lesbian couple that lived in San Francisco. Tina was upset by all this because he wanted to be part of his niece's life. Overall, though, it was the best choice for Tammy. But Tina was bothered to see that his mother and sister were in these bad situations with men. So he went ahead and moved in with a friend named Tracy Beals, who lived with her mother. Tracy was a junior in high school, and Tina's other friend Sarah did not like Tracy. Sarah felt like Tracy wanted Tina all to herself. So Tracy made the rules in this relationship that she had with Tina. She was very possessive and even started beating up Tina if he didn't follow her rules. But Tina at least had a very serious crush on Tracy. And he had made up a photo album of his time with Tracy and even called himself Tina Brandon Beals for a while. So it was serious. Serious. Now, Tina and Tracy traveled together all over Nebraska and South Dakota. They visited Mount Rushmore and the Badlands. I mean, they, they did a lot of traveling. Yeah, and these are high school kids, so it's a little yeah. weird how much independence they had, isn't it? It is. Tina gave Tracy most of his attention, but he still liked boys. And for a couple of years, Tina had a crush on a tall, blonde, popular guy at school. But overall, though, Tina was beginning to realize that he was different from other young women. There was no one on TV or in the movies who Tina could see as a role model or hope to emulate. Now, something was missing for Tina, and this made him feel depressed and out of place. Well, I can only imagine how that would feel especially back then when nobody really seemed to have any understanding or empathy for the situation. Yeah, none whatsoever. So these feelings, of course, made Tina believe that he had something wrong with him. Amazingly, back in the 1980s and 90s, this concept of being transgender was really not known, and it was very misunderstood by most of the public. In fact, the word transgender really wasn't part of our vocabulary at all back then. The phrase LGBT did not exist in America at all. What did exist was a gay and lesbian community, but at that point, they didn't all accept transgender people as being a part of them. 
So transgender people were really just on the outside looking in without a community until they established their own. Back in those days, the early 90s, while Tina was beginning to transition and trying to figure himself out, no one other than activists even discussed gender issues. He was considered a freak by most people and a person with a gender identity crisis by those who knew something about transgendered individuals. The idea, actually, of being transgender was a foreign concept to the mainstream public. So you can imagine how difficult this would be for a young person growing up in the rural Midwest. Incredibly difficult. And what happened is Tina really liked his body before puberty, but then admitted to being sickened by it once breasts were developing and he was starting to look like a woman. He had no desire to be feminine at all. He didn't want to have a wedding with the white gown and all that that his sister and her friends talked about. Tina actually wanted to play football and went through a phase of wanting to be a priest. Now, the friend she was living with, Tracy, was becoming more and more possessive of Tina. And Sarah had seen handprints and bruises on Tina's arms and wrists. Tracy had started out by slapping Tina, but then she had moved up to restraining and punching him. So it was kind of what you'd think of as a classic abusive relationship, with Tracy hitting Tina in a rage and then apologizing and getting forgiveness. That cycle of abuse. Yeah, repeat, repeat, repeat. So Tina became friends with a, a guy she had a crush on named Brian Van Slyke. These two would hang out racing cars on the local roads and just had a blast. They got traffic fines, and Tina eventually had his driver's license suspended. Now, even though Tina didn't want to wear a dress, he was hoping that Brian would ask him to the prom. But he didn't. Brian asked another girl, and this obviously hurt and upset Tina, because he had pictured them in matching tuxedos together at the prom. Right, so you can kind of see how he was thinking. And aside from the controlling dynamics in Tina and Tracy's relationship, it's also possible that Tina was stealing from Tracy. This would become a part of Tina's life. After breaking up with Tracy, Tina stayed with his sister Tammy for a while, but it didn't last long. Tina seemed like a different person to Tammy. He'd been a good student, but he'd stopped going to school. Tammy drove her sister to the high school to make sure that he wouldn't skip, but Tina would leave and spend the day hanging out with his friends instead of going to school. And then things started to disappear from Tammy's house. Tina denied stealing them. But Tammy didn't believe him, and their relationship kind of fell apart. So then Tina went back to his mother's place. There, he knew he could get away with most anything, because Joanne never questioned him, and Joanne was a lot easier to mislead than his sister was. So and Joanne was busy working at the mall and wasn't home that much anyway. Yeah, so it was October of 1990 when Tina moved in with his mom, and he decided he wanted to join the Army but he was really disappointed when he failed the written exam and for some reason gave up and didn't try again. And that December, Tina went to a skateboard park with a group of friends, and this was one of his first outings where he tried to pass as a boy. And it turns out that was something that he did like to do is around the house, try and look like a boy, put socks in his underwear, and he and his friend Sarah had decided, wouldn't it be fun if they went out to the skateboard park and Tina went as a boy to see how people reacted. So that's what they did. And when he was there, he met a 13-year-old girl who he started seeing. At this point, Tina was 18. He met the girl's 14-year-old friend, Heather, and Heather became his girlfriend. So this is when Tina began going by the name Billy. This started when Tina got a call from Liz Delano, a girl who just happened to call the wrong number. And Liz thought Tina was a guy and started flirting with him. And he liked that. He told her his name was Billy and started speaking in a lower voice. So it really seemed to give Tina a lot of happiness to pass as a man. Yeah, well, if he's thinking that he's in the wrong body, it'd be nice to recognize that, yeah, I, I can do this. Yeah, it must have been a relief, really. Now, he'd thought about it for so long, but he never believed he'd actually go through with it. However, from then on, Liz kept calling him Billy, 
and they made a date for New Year's Eve. Billy wore dockers with a t-shirt under a button-down shirt, and he and Liz were pretty attracted to one another. They held hands on the roller skating rink as Sarah watched. Sarah loved the idea of Tina play-acting, and she felt like there was no harm in it. Liz was just 13, and there seemed to be nothing sexual going on. But Billy was serious about it. He just loved being Billy Brinson. So he would bind his breasts with an ace bandage, and he would put a sock in his underwear to help him look like a man. Yeah, now Tina was petite, like five foot five, 110 pounds. So he did appear small for a male, which made him seem younger than he was. In 1991, Billy moved in with the 14-year-old Heather and her mother, and Joanne was really upset and angry over this. She tried calling Heather to warn her that Billy was actually a girl named Tina, but Heather started refusing Joanne's calls because Billy was telling Heather that his mother was just a crazy drunk who hated all of his girlfriends. So we're getting to the point where he's going to be passing as a male. Yes. He's dressing as a male and referring himself as a male and interested in women. Yeah, and Joanne was just not on board or very supportive. I don't imagine she would have been. On June 21, 1991, Joanne was met by a policeman at her front door, and she was served with a criminal complaint for disturbing the peace. Now, she'd never been in trouble with the law before, and she couldn't believe that her own daughter would try to get her into trouble because the complaint was made by Billy, Tina. He had saved an answer machine tape with harassing messages from Joanne and brought them to the police. And on the tape, Joanne was calling them lesbians and even threatened them. Joanne felt like she had been rejected by her own child. Five days later, the complaint was dropped, but Joanne stayed upset. In an effort to put an end to Tina living as Billy, Joanne tried to reach Heather. She felt like Tina was wrong for living with a 14, 15-year-old girl. And if they were having sex, Tina could be arrested for statutory rape. Yeah, so what a situation. So Heather's in the ninth grade at Lincoln Junior High when she met and fell for Billy slash Tina. And Heather thought he was just gorgeous and perfect for her. He did really attract the girls. And Heather couldn't stop talking about him. So on Valentine's Day 1991, Heather sent him roses. They arrived at the high school with a card addressed to Billy Brinson. And the handful of people who watched Tina accept the flower delivery just didn't ask any questions. After Billy had moved in with Heather, that's when he started going by Brandon. And they learned that the two of them really had a lot in common. Both had been raised by a single parent, and they both knew the struggle of not having enough money and sometimes just going without even enough food. Also, both had been victims of sexual molestation by a family member. So Heather had started out just as friends with Brandon. She never questioned his sex because he looked and acted like a guy to her. Right, and he presented himself that way to her. Oh, for sure. So he, there Completely. was never any knowledge of his life as a female. No, and that's part of the problem is that he really didn't share it with people. Although, on the other hand, I could understand how that would be tough. Yes, it could be. Yeah, I mean, to put it mildly. But he did have male friends who he played basketball and drank beer with. And another really good part of Brandon and Heather's eyes was that he didn't act tough like other guys. He was sensitive, and he wasn't afraid to cry in front of her. And she liked that. Now, after three months with Heather, Brandon gave her a promise ring and he promised to love her forever. He complimented her, he showed her affection, but never pressured her for sex. They slept together, they cuddled, but no further than that. They talked about having a future together, about marriage, and even about starting a family. Well, when Brandon discussed his childhood sexual abuse with Heather, he explained to her that he was actually born a hermaphrodite, which is not true and that's someone who's born with both sexes. So he said he was born with both sexes, but that his mom had made the decision to raise him as a female, which was the incorrect decision. So he told Heather that he had had an operation and was now a male. Now Heather's 14 and she really didn't understand what he was even saying. 
and they didn't go into the details. But we know that Brandon had not had any surgery, and he had been born completely female. Yeah, now, he didn't have the money anyway for sex reassignment surgery. Back in the 1990s, almost all gender-affirming surgeries were classified as self-pay. It's really only in the past decade that private insurances, Medicare and Medicaid, have been increasingly paying for these surgeries. There's policies banning discrimination based on gender identity, and they've been crucial in getting transgendered patients the mental health care and medical care they need. Super important. It certainly is. Yeah. If Brandon had gotten the care he needed, and if he had decided on surgery, it was going to cost him anywhere from 20000 to $70,000, depending on what needed to be done. So it might as well have been a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't have anything to even piss on. No. So according to a recent study in the Journal of the American Medical Association, coverage for gender-affirming surgery by private insurance has really increased. The study in 2014 showed that it had increased from 25% in 2011 to 45% in 2014. And in line with that, the number of patients identified as self-pay has decreased, and that was down to 39% in 2014. But, you know, this progress doesn't help Brandon, a transgender person living in poverty in the early 1990s, because things were just not the same then. No, and aside from this, he lived in a culture of ignorance, at least as pertained to transgender issues. So Brandon was living with shame, confusion, and he began his adult life telling lies in order to protect himself. He dropped out of school his senior year. Even though he worked, he got into trouble for stealing. Right. So Brandon stole and Brandon lied a lot, but we can also see that he was dealing with a lot. With all this going on, it really isn't surprising that he began this life of financial crimes. Most of these crimes were for relatively small amounts of money, and he often used what he stole to buy gifts for other people. And perhaps this was a way to get approval. That was very important to him. But Brandon was arrested numerous times for writing bad checks and for using other people's credit cards and ATM cards to make purchases. And a lot of the stuff he bought was just completely unnecessary. So there's definitely a very strong psychological component to this behavior. I'm not a psychiatrist, but I definitely can see that. What do you think? Oh, no question about it. Uh, The first time he was caught stealing, he took a person's checkbook and wrote checks for music tapes, shoes, and t-shirts. When he lived with Heather, he took her mother's checkbook and ATM card, took cash from her mother's account, but said he had just done it to buy food, clothing, and gas for the household. So he wasn't trying to do anything for himself. Well, that's what he said. Right. Now, after the mother's check started bouncing, she reported this to the police. Brandon was found at a restaurant in Lincoln and was cited for two counts of second-degree forgery. At this point, he had already been charged with possession of stolen property and had been ordered to pay a $500 fine. He also spent three days in jail. In 1991, he was sentenced to 18 months probation. As part of his probation, he had to agree to complete his GED within a year, and he had to agree to attend counseling. So Brandon's mom, Joanne, was sure that Brandon was a lesbian. Joanne and Tammy had noticed that Brandon was putting socks in his pants to create a bulge. Heather didn't visit the house often, but when she did, Joanne would call Brandon Tina. Joanne asked Heather if she knew that Brandon was female, and Heather would just nod. Because Brandon told Heather that his mother could not accept that he was a male. Or sometimes he'd say she's just joking. So this is really fucked up. It really is. Yeah. Brandon and Heather's relationship was going downhill. He did everything he could think of to keep her. But she didn't trust him anymore. And in January of 1992, Brandon moved out of Heather's house. He told Joanne that he was moving in with a couple of his guy friends into a trailer. Well, Joanne was really worried about her daughter, even though a lot of what she did I can't agree with. Tina wasn't Tina anymore. She was Brandon, and he was making choices which were very concerning to his family and to his old friend Sarah. 
Sarah and Joanne were really concerned for his safety at this point. They worried that the guys he'd moved in with would learn that he was still physically a female and might hurt him, which is kind of a prophetic thing. It is, but that's the culture. Yeah, it was very homophobic, as well as there being a complete lack of understanding of what was going on. In early 1992, we were looking at about a year in his transformation into uh, full-time maleness, Sarah and Joanne started getting very nervous about Brandon. He was hardly eating, and he was down to about 100 pounds in weight. They also developed an obsessiveness with showering, and he would take several showers a day. So Sarah spoke to Heather about Brandon's sexuality, explaining that Brandon had told her he felt like a man inside, and he was in love with Heather. And Sarah also told Heather that Brandon was born a female and still had periods and female sex organs. Now this surprised Heather, who cared about Brandon, but she was certainly very confused about being in love with a female. Well, yeah. This was all very overwhelming for Brandon, of course, too, who probably felt unlovable. Sarah called Joanne one evening because she had to call 911 for Brandon. He'd swallowed a bottle of antibiotic pills as a suicidal gesture, and he had been rushed to the hospital. This was late January 1992, and Brandon was admitted to the Lancaster County Crisis Center. Brandon claimed he was only depressed because he had hurt Heather by lying to her. And of course, Heather is very confused and upset. She said she loved Brandon, but she had her own identity to figure out. I mean, she's pretty much a child. She's, what, 14? So she would never considered that she might be gay, but she did have strong feelings for Brandon. So she's super confused. Yeah, well, that's an understatement. Sure. Yeah, I can imagine. Brandon agreed to be an inpatient at Lancaster Crisis Center, and he was placed on suicide watch, and Joanne was called. Joanne told the crisis center workers that Brandon had been refusing to see a doctor for years, and that's because he didn't want to be examined as a female. Joanne was able to admit that she had a difficult time understanding her daughter and that Tina would never be honest with her. So the psychiatrist, who he had talked to, said he really needed long-term psychological treatment, that he was a pathological liar, and he was really just losing his entire identity. So this was a young person in crisis. Yeah, and in his initial interview with the crisis center workers, Brandon confessed to having a sexual relationship with Heather, explaining that he had been introducing himself to younger girls as Billy Brandon. He said he wanted to be a man, but his family was not supportive, and he wasn't sure about having sex reassignment surgery. He also admitted that he had 12 forgery charges pending against him and a possible charge of sexual assault of a minor. He denied being suicidal. He said that he was completing two courses in order to get his GED, but he wasn't attending school on a regular basis. No, he said he wanted to move to Denver and go to art school and denied any need for therapy, and denied family issues. But of course, the attending physician was very concerned about him. Brandon said that he had been raped in October of 1990, but refused to share any details about that. And he admitted he'd never had any counseling after the rape. So the doctor described Brandon as a slender girl of small stature who did not appear to be depressed or psychotic, which surprises me. Because I think he had to be depressed. He was definitely depressed. So he was diagnosed with a mild case of identity disorder, adding that his judgment was impaired in his personal relationships. After a few days of counseling at the crisis center, Brandon agreed to talk with his mom, Joanne, about his sexuality. And when he told his mom that a therapist had suggested a sex reassignment surgery, Joanne laughed. She thought it was a joke. Yeah, but Brandon told Joanne that he felt more like a man inside than a woman. Joanne didn't have any idea how to respond to that. The surgery would require a lot of psychological analysis, and Joanne didn't believe that Brandon was taking this issue as seriously as he should. Besides that, I mean, just think about Joanne. She was pretty devastated that her daughter wanted to be a man, and she just didn't understand what was going on here. 
Yeah, I mean, they really could have benefited from some group therapy, meeting some other people in similar circumstances. But they were kind of living in an area where that wasn't possible. It's what we call an underserved area. Exactly. Although I'm not sure, I mean, if the therapists weren't able to recognize depression in Brenna, I'm, I'm not sure how helpful they would have been. Well, exactly. And I guess basically back then, all that they would diagnose is a identity disorder with gender. So he didn't even get like a correct diagnosis as mm -hmm. far as being transgender. Nope. But Joanne was realistic knowing that the surgery would take a long time to get done and be very expensive. And definitely Brandon needed to go through some therapy before making such a decision. But for whatever reason, Brandon denied wanting that surgery when talking with the mental health workers. So he was at the center for about a week, but didn't participate in group therapy and wasn't very responsive to the one-on-one -on -one therapy either. His main interest seemed to be in calling Heather. He seemed kind of obsessed with that. He even cheated with his phone privileges and ended up getting into trouble just so that he could call Heather. Now, he did seem to get some peace of mind from a book titled The Courage to Heal, and this had been given to him at the center. Brandon told the counselor that he identified with problems listed in the book and even began to keep a journal. And for a while, he seemed happier and he was participating in activities with other clients. So that's just way too short of a time. And I'm sure that was probably money related. He had no money. So they keep him a week and out he goes. That's kind of how the mental health system still works. It certainly does. So during a one-on-one -on -one counseling session, Brandon talked about feeling unloved by Joanne and did discuss some of the family's dysfunction. He described the sexual abuse in his childhood, saying that he felt really intimidated by certain men, and he always felt sexually oriented towards women. He said that he wanted to be a male and to not have to deal with the negative feelings of being a lesbian. So there's a lot of confusion here. There certainly is. And another thing he said is that he felt less intimidated by men when he lived as a male. So you've got the transgender issue, but then you've also got the childhood abuse. So it really needed to be worked out yeah, with therapy. This kid, kid, he's more of an adult, but he, he really needs a lot of psychotherapy. Yes, exactly. There, there's so much stuff going on in his life that would possibly be helped by therapy, but he wasn't able to do it. No, which is really sad to me. I mean, there were just so many issues that made it difficult or impossible to get the help he needed. And part of that was him, you know, he was resistant to it for whatever reason. He was. Brandon did deny wanting to kill himself, but he did admit that he took all those antibiotics to try and make a point or get some attention. And his therapist noted that he was very immature and had a lot of trouble expressing his emotions. Brandon was encouraged to live as a man in order to prepare himself for possible sex change surgery, and he really liked that idea. But the problem is he didn't become involved in continuing psychotherapy which, of course, would be essential if he was going to transition. Well, I mean, that's absolutely. really part of it. Yeah. Sure, a big part of it. Big part. While he was in the crisis center, Brandon contacted the Lancaster County attorney, and he was trying to get them to put a hold on his forgery charges. He told the attorney's office that he had agreed to commit himself voluntarily, and he promised to appear at the county jail upon his release from the center. On February 6th, Brandon was discharged from the crisis center, after the mental health board met and decided that he could move on to outpatient treatment. Now, he had a discharge diagnosis of transsexualism and personality disorder. He was taken to jail because of those forgery charges. He stayed in jail for several days until his grandmother bailed him out. He started going to regular counseling sessions and seemed to be making progress in accepting himself as a male. Two weeks into his sessions, Joanne was invited to attend. She went with the expectation that she would learn about transsexualism. But the first time she went, Brandon brought up that he had been molested as a child by a male relative. Joanne was shocked, or at least seemed that way. She said she had no idea anything like that had happened. She cried with Brandon, 
and apologized for not protecting him as a child. She wanted to confront the man right away, but Brandon asked her not to. He just wanted to put this whole thing behind him. Right, but Joanne also learned that her older daughter Tammy had been molested by that same relative, and after confirming it with Tammy, Joanne did want to notify the police. She just couldn't believe that her daughters had hidden it from her. She felt certain that the perpetrator had destroyed Tina, and he was the reason why Tina was now Brandon and why he had no interest in men. So she's blaming the whole thing on the molestation, which I think is partially valid, but certainly not completely. Oh, no. No, no, no. So soon after getting out of this crisis center, Brandon got a new girlfriend. He was 19 at this point, and the girlfriend was 15. Her name was Rihanna Allen. And she was crazy about Brandon, didn't question anything that he told her. Even though he had trouble keeping a job, he was really good at making these young girls think that he was well off. There was a whole group at Rihanna's junior high school who were just in love with him. They would whistle when he walked by and try and get his attention. They all thought he was so cute and he dressed better than the other boys they knew. So he was really seen as a real catch. Rihanna was a popular girl and Brandon really seemed to adore her. So, you know, he had that look like the teen idols have of being a little bit feminine, kind of small, and the tweens love those boys. Around this time, Brandon purchased a rubber penis, which he tucked into his pants. Rihanna found it, found it hidden in a pair of socks. It was the soft and somewhat real looking kind. Rihanna had dreams about Brandon being her lover, but it never worked out. Later, she would say that all they ever did was kiss. Now, Rihanna's mother, Brenda, accepted Brandon more easily than the other guys that Rihanna had brought home. Brandon acted a gentleman, and Brenda felt like she didn't have to worry about Rihanna with him. Which is kind of true. Yeah. Brenda liked him, and he actually became part of the family. He helped out around the house. He bought Rihanna roses and pizza. He'd wash the dishes, scrub the bathrooms, even shampooing the carpets. So that, to me, just seems like really trying hard for approval. Really trying hard. No question. But as soon as Joanne found out where Brandon was living, she called up to speak to Rihanna's mother. Joanne told her mother, Brenda, that she couldn't really explain things on the phone and that they needed to talk in person. So she convinced Brenda that it was urgent and that she and Rihanna needed to come to her house and speak with her. Joanne told Brenda and Rihanna about Brandon being a female when they came to her house. She even showed them Brandon's birth certificate. Rihanna had trouble believing it and became really upset. Brandon had told her the hermaphrodite story and how Joanne couldn't accept that he was a male. So Rihanna kind of was blaming Joanne for this. And I'm just curious, how do you feel about Joanne's behavior here, contacting these people? Well, you know, I I guess on the one hand, she's still trying to look out for Brandon, not wanting him to get hurt. But on the other hand, if he's going to pose or live as a male, I don't think she has any reason or any, any way she's supposed to be going around talking to people about it. Well, yeah, I mean, Brandon's an adult at this point, so I think she really overstepped. Although I can kind of see that Brandon really had no business being with these young girls. Yeah, but I would bet that Joanne didn't think of it that way. No, how do you think she thought of it? That he's deceiving these women. Right. And and she's setting the story straight. But it's really not helping him. No, it's not helping him. The way she did it was really hurting him. Well, yeah. But I don't think she was doing it out of malice. No, but I think there's a lot of ignorance behind her. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But regardless of what sex organs Brandon had, Rihanna and Brandon stayed close. For a while, they took line dancing lessons together, and Brandon wore a cowboy hat and cowboy boots. Brandon looked handsome in this Western gear, and Rihanna really loved that people thought he was her boyfriend. He convinced her that his grandmother was really wealthy and that she was going to be sending him to France to have his sex reassignment surgery. He even asked her if she'd come along with him to Europe, and she agreed. So that's not cool why he's doing that. No. He is misleading people. 
although I can see the pain and the issues behind this behavior. Right now, their relationship didn't last because they fought all the time. Rihanna's cousin finally was able to convince her that she needed to break up with Brandon. Well, who are these parents that think it's okay for their teenage daughter to have a guy move in no matter how nice he is? Right. It's just bizarre. And they were sleeping together. Yep. The cousin pointed out that even if Brandon did get a sex change, it wouldn't matter because he was just too jealous and too dishonest and just not the kind of person that Rihanna should marry. So he did move out, and Rihanna took all the pictures of her and Brandon and destroyed them. Yeah, but Brandon kind of went from girl to girl and was dishonest. Oh, he, he went after women like crazy. He did. And unfortunately, the theft was a big part of his life, and that continued. In 1991, he'd been arrested on a forgery charge and served those three days in jail. Then in 1992, he was convicted of second-degree forgery. So this is when he got the probation, but he failed to attend counseling or get his GED. So he didn't seem to be learning anything from being arrested. His counselor reported, Attendance is sporadic and infrequent. Tina does what is needed to get by. No change is noted in taking responsibility, personal growth, or attitude. So not good. Not good. So he was terminated from the, the program. The counselor wrote that Tina told so many different versions of things, it was hard to know what to believe. And although he did have jobs, I mean, they, they weren't high-paying jobs, but he was employed at a series of jobs. Yeah. Brandon continued to steal from people that he knew. He would forge checks on his grandmother's bank accounts. He ran up almost $900 on Sarah's ATM card. And then in 1993, he was charged with 18 crimes, mostly forgery and failure to appear in court. From Brandon's standpoint, he didn't see anything wrong with what he was doing because he said that everything he took, he gave to his girlfriends. And he would blow off court dates, and he certainly wasn't afraid to lie to the judges. Not at all. He tried to move away from these legal problems in mid-1993. He moved to the Falls River area of Nebraska in Richardson County. Richardson County is one of the poorer counties in Nebraska, and he became friends with some local people who were around his age, and he identified only as male with all of these people. And that's when he moved in with a young woman named Lisa Lambert. Lisa was a young unwed mother who lived with her baby boy Tanner in an old farmhouse in the town of Humboldt which was in Richardson County. So really kind of out in the boonies. But Lisa was very drawn to Brandon, probably because he showered her with compliments and he was very kind to her and her baby son. Brandon saw Lisa as the perfect mother and he was always complimenting her for how she cared for Tanner. So Lisa would brag about Brandon to her friends and family, talking about how good he was with Tanner. She just loved it when it was just she, Brandon, and Tanner spending time at home relaxing and watching movies. She really appreciated having his company. Because before Lisa had Tanner, she was a bit wild. She had moved to Phoenix for a few months when she was first pregnant, still looking for excitement. But now she was happy to be just miles away from her hometown. She didn't care about going out anymore. When Brandon told her he wanted to adopt Tanner and help her to raise him, she thought this was just great. She'd found the perfect guy. Because Tanner had had issues, he'd been a sick baby. He was born two months premature, so he'd been in an incubator in a neonatal nursery for about a week. And at home, he continued to have allergy and respiratory problems. So Lisa really had her hands full with Tanner. And she did understand that it wasn't easy for Brandon to be around him and her all the time because Tanner cried a lot. He was a lot of work, like any other baby. A lot of work. But Brandon never complained. Still, Lisa could see that he was getting impatient and bored with her. So she didn't mind when he started going out again with some other friends. Now, Lisa hung out with some local ex-convicts in their early 20s. Yeah, it wasn't a good group of people. Well, not exactly. John Lauder and Marvin Nissen. Brandon met these guys, and, and this was when Lauder had recently been released from prison. There was a former girlfriend of Lauder, 17-year-old named Lana Tisdale, 
who was also part of this group. So Brandon was attracted to Lana, and the two seemed to have some kind of sexual and romantic relationship. Lauder didn't seem jealous of the relationship, but Lisa was certainly hurt by it. The group of friends partied together often. Eventually, Lauder and Nitsen became friends with Brandon, but they didn't know that Brandon had been raised previously as a female. They just knew that he was a boy. That's yes. what he told everybody. Right. So Lana and Leslie Tisdale lived with their mother, Linda, who was on disability. And in the fall of 1993, the three of them lived in a Falls City rental house that had just become kind of a place for boyfriends and other misfits off the street to crash for a few days here and there. And Brandon was one of these boyfriends that crashed there. Lana's older sister, Leslie, was the more troubled of the Tisdale girls. She'd been in and out of detention centers and abusive relationships since her early teens. So Leslie joined the Job Corps in Denison, Iowa that year, trying to get her life together, I guess. Yeah, and that's where she met Philip Devine. Philip had overcome many hardships in his life also. He was born two months premature. He had a heart defect, crossed eyes, and a right leg that ended at his knee. But he became very agile with his prosthetic leg even competing in several sports. Yeah, and he was super popular and successful at the Job Corps. He had been presented as one of the program's model citizens at a Job Corps conference that he attended, where he met two Iowa senators. And his plan was to transfer to a Job Corps program in Colorado when his new girlfriend, Leslie Tisdale, invited him to Falls City to spend Christmas break with her. Brandon was arrested in November 1993 in Richardson County. This was on a minor possession charge, and he was carrying a driver's license of a man named Charles Brayman. Brayman was actually one of Brandon's cousins. Then, on December 15, 1993, Brandon was arrested again for forgery after he again stole and wrote bad checks. So he couldn't make bail, and he was held in the Richardson County Jail, the women's jail. So this is what started out these people he'd met in Richardson County discovering that he wasn't a male. He's going to get outed. Yes. So he had called Lisa and some of the other girls and asked them to help bail him out of jail. His arrest was published in the newspaper, and this exposed him as a female named Tina Brandon. Brandon hadn't called his sister Tammy or mother Joanne for help because he assumed they'd let him sit there just to teach him a lesson. They had bailed him out before, and he had never made positive changes. No, I mean, he never paid anyone back for bailing him out. Nope. While he was in jail for seven days, two of his girlfriends, Kelly and Lisa, were on the phone with, with one another a lot, talking about how it could be possible that Brandon was female. Yeah, they were pretty shocked by it. In the middle of one of their conversations, Brandon actually broke through on the call waiting, and Kelly talked to him. She told him that she and Lisa had decided to bail him out, but they really hadn't. They were actually very angry with Brandon for lying, and they didn't want to see him anymore. But for whatever reason, Kelly didn't tell him that. Lisa, for her part, felt especially stupid, like she'd been tricked, because she had had intercourse with him and she said she never noticed anything unusual about it. She had been drunk at the time, which explains it a little bit. Well, I just, I don't see, unless you're willfully ignoring information, I don't see how you could make love with him and not figure out that he was female. Yes, I know, it's hard to believe. December 20th, Brandon made a felony first appearance before a Richardson County judge. After the forgery charge was read, the court told him the penalty, imprisonment of not more than five years or a fine of not more than $10,000 or both. Before he was sworn in, he requested a public defender. Yeah, but Brandon was asked several questions this time by the prosecutor and just lied like it came second nature. He claimed to be working at Peru State College. He said he was making minimum wage. And when asked if he was liable for the support of anyone other than himself, He said that he had an eight-month-old baby girl named Jessica, who was staying with his roommate in Humboldt. So totally made that up out of the blue. Yeah. 
They didn't have a report of any outstanding warrant, so the judge set bond at $2,500, which meant that it only took $250 to get him out. And it was Lana who ended up coming up with the money. She got her father to sign a blank check by telling him it was for her to go get a perm. And she was able to cash that check at the supermarket across from the courthouse. But because she was still under age, it was Tom Nissen who went in and posted Brandon's bond. So a little bit about Tom. He'd had a terrible childhood, and he had an arrest record starting from when he was a minor. So this guy was a thief, a drug addict, and he could also be very violent. His mother even suspected that Tom had once tried to burn down the family home. Tom had been in jail for possession and arson just earlier that year and had been released that May. So it's not a good crowd to be around. At least not Tom and John, that's for sure. That's for definite. Now, Lana had figured out that just about everything Brandon told her was a lie. But she did have feelings for him, and she wanted to stick by him. With his numerous lies and his sexual identity questions, Lana became confused. She really wanted to believe he was a male. After all, she had slept with him, and she had never questioned his manhood. Right. Now, looking back, though, she remembered that whenever they were together, Brandon had kept the lights out. She also didn't remember him ever having an ejaculation. When he did get out of jail, Brandon told Lana that he had had an operation and he did, in fact, have a penis. When she visited him in jail, Lana had seen Brandon's chest for the first time as he was leaning over while he was wearing his orange V-neck jail-issued shirt. She clearly saw his female breasts. On the ride home from jail, he explained he was a hermaphrodite and told her he wanted the penis first and then the breast surgery would come later. So such a tangled web, which is really hard to live a life like that. I mean, sure, the people he's lying to, it's horrible, but just imagine living a life where you feel like you have to lie about just about everything. It has to be so stressful and unhealthy. I can't imagine. It just seems like a, such a horrible situation. I know, it's really super sad. So let's jump ahead to Christmas Eve, 1993. Brandon and Lana seemed very much in love. They were kissing and touching each other, and some other people at the house were really annoyed with this. Of course, everyone was drinking heavily, and especially John Lauder, I guess. And Lauder was getting really obnoxious. By one o'clock in the morning, he was getting really rude and even being mean, And he started teasing Brandon, calling him a girl, and telling him that he was horny, suggesting he wanted to have sex with him. Brandon told John to just forget it. Then Tom Nissen was also going after Brandon. Several times that night, he approached Brandon and said, I'm tired of hollering at you. Why don't you just tell the truth and get it over with? So Brandon and Tom got into this verbal altercation. Tom pointed his finger at Brandon Brandon pushed Tom against the wall, and they were both in each other's faces, yelling. They then moved into the bathroom, where Brandon pushed Tom again, this time knocking him into a cabinet. After he hit the floor, he got up and punched Brandon. And remember, Brandon's trying to act like a tough guy, but he's really tiny. Yeah, he's a lot smaller than these guys. Yes. And then John entered the bathroom, so they're ganging up on him, and he closed the door behind him. So a lot of people had conversations with Brandon in that bathroom. But Brandon had just tried to laugh it off. By this point in the night, Lana had gone home to be with her mother for Christmas. So Tom and John decided that they needed to see Brandon's genitals and get the answer for themselves. With both John and Tom locked in the bathroom with him, Brandon really had no choice but to show them. So he unzipped his pants and started pulling them down so they could see that there was something sticking out from behind the zipper. Well, what is that? Tom kept asking. What is it? Brandon said, that's my dick. And he took Tom's hand and guided it towards the zipper and told him to feel it. But something about it didn't seem right, so Tom grabbed Brandon very angrily. Yeah, he was pretty pissed. And I don't understand why. Me either. They were just angry about this. Yeah, and the alcohol. Don't forget that. Right. They're violent people, they're drunk, and obviously homophobic. Good combination. Yeah, never a good combination. 
So Tom had called the police station and asked about having Brandon's bond revoked. He was told it couldn't be done. That pissed him off even more. He told the assistant police chief he was worried about Lana getting her money back. By then, Nissen was sick of dealing with Brandon. He decided that he and Lana would have to take care of Brandon themselves. So the two of them pushed Brandon back into the bathroom. And a few minutes later, everyone in the living room heard a loud thump, which was Brandon getting knocked down. So Tom held his hands, John pulled his pants down and his underwear down, and saw that Brandon was in fact a female. So how humiliating and awful is that? Isn't it? Yeah. It was after 2 a.m. Christmas Day, so just like an hour or so after the bathroom incident, when Lauder and Nissen pulled up at the Stevenson Hotel, which wasn't far from the house. And that's where Brandon had run out of the house to try and make a call for help. He'd wanted someone to drive down and get him. But when Nissen saw Brandon on the phone, he told him to hurry up, that he was coming with him and John. So Brandon reluctantly went with John and Tom, and they stopped over at Lana Tisdale's house. Lauder stayed in the car while Nissen ran in, letting Lana's mother, Linda, know that Brandon was definitely a girl. When Nissen told her that he had Brandon out in the car, Linda made it known that Brandon was no longer welcome in her house. So she was angry too, which is kind of confounding to me. Why an adult would be angry about this? I and mean, wouldn't you see that there are issues here? Well, a normal person might. <laughs> yeah, again, these are rural, homophobic, undereducated people. Yes. So, yeah, of course, I, a lot of rural people are educated. Yes. Okay. I, I didn't mean to suggest that all rural people were undereducated. Oh, I know. I just wanted to point that out so we wouldn't get emails. We still will. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think that she just said the, the easy way is uh, he's not welcome in my house anymore. I guess. But, you know, Lana was right there on the basement stairs and overheard the conversation. And she knew that if she wanted to continue seeing Brandon, it was going to have to be secret from then on out. So when Lauder and Nissen got back to Nissen's place with Brandon, everybody else was either gone or asleep. And Brandon knew something bad was going to happen to him. Nissen said to him, John and I need to talk to you, and they shoved him back in the bathroom. Lauder turned around and held the door, and Tom hit Brandon, knocking him into the tub. Then they punched him repeatedly and kicked him in the ribs as he was just lying there on the floor. Then the three left the house, and Brandon was forced into a car. They drove to an area by a meatpacking plant in Richardson County, kind of a deserted area, and that's where these men assaulted and raped Brandon. Then they returned to Nissen's home, where they ordered Brandon to take a shower. You know, think they're being real smart or something. Right, they were. They're awful. Brandon escaped from the bathroom by climbing out the window, and he went to Lana's house. She convinced Brandon that he should file a police report. However, you know, Nissen and Lauder had warned him not to tell the police about the rape or they were going to silence him permanently. Brandon went to the emergency room where a standard rape kit was assembled, which got lost somehow later on. Sheriff Charles Lowe questioned Brandon about the rape. If you listen to the audio tape, you're going to see that the sheriff was not very empathetic and he seemed especially interested in Brandon's transsexuality. I guess interested is a good way to put it. Yeah, in a creepy way. Exactly. I mean, some of the questions were just unrelated to the crime and, you know, frankly insulting. Lowe had apparently never heard of a transgender person before. And from the way he questioned Brandon, Lowe seemed to find his sexuality to be disgusting. And he even referred to Brandon as it. Well, yeah, I mean, for example... Brandon had said that in the bathroom they hadn't fondled him or anything when they pulled his pants down. And the sheriff was like, well, wouldn't they want to do that? Why wouldn't they do that? Yeah. Just creepy and, and humiliating, you know, like victimizing the victim. He was supposed to be learning about the crime inflicted on Brandon, but just repeatedly veered off and asked these irrelevant questions. When Brandon refused to answer some, he treated him as if he was being uncooperative. And also, the last part of the recorded interview was somehow lost, as was the rape kit. 
So part of the conversation's missing, and we have no idea what that was. Still, Brandon did sign the complaint, which was a brave thing to do. But of course, he believed that Nissen and Lauder would be picked up. Yeah, well, you know, they had pretty extensive criminal records. You would think they'd be picked up. Right. I think that was a pretty safe thing to think would happen. But it didn't. No. After Nissen and Lauder learned about the rape complaint, they went out searching for Brandon to hurt him or kill him. They didn't find him, but three days later, the police finally questioned them about the rape. Two deputies believed that the men should have been arrested, but it was Sheriff Lau who told them not to make the arrests. Brandon's sister Tammy even called the sheriff and asked why the men had not been arrested. And he basically told her, you need to stay out of it. I'll do what I think is necessary. So, total shitball, that guy. He blew it big time. Yeah, I mean, just terrible. So, on December 28th at 8 o'clock in the morning, Lauder and Nissen were at the Falls City Police Department to answer questions about the alleged assault, rape, and abduction of Brandon. When investigator Hayes asked Lauder to come back into his office and advised him of his Miranda rights, Lauder waived the warnings. Now, Lauder knew Nissen had already been interviewed, so he wanted to set the record straight. So the first thing he said was he didn't know if he could remember much about Christmas Eve. Everyone had partied a lot at Nissen's house, and there was a lot of alcohol that had been consumed. Right, but he explained that a couple of days before the party... Lana had called him and asked if he would find out what sex Brandon actually was. And he had told Lana that he would if he had the chance. Then on Christmas Eve, he and Nissen spent a lot of time talking to Brandon, trying to convince him to tell everyone what sex he was. Although it's really nobody's business. So Lauder admitted that while he and Nissen were with Brandon, one of them told him he could either show them or they were going to find out on their own. So according to Lauder, Nissen and Lana dragged Brandon into the bathroom to try and determine his sex. And ten minutes later, Lauder entered the bathroom and saw a rolled up sock lying on the floor next to Brandon. He asked Brandon to explain it, but Brandon didn't answer. Lauder denied being present when Brandon was beat up, saying that he heard a thump and walked in to find Brandon lying naked on the floor with Nissen standing over him. So Lauder claimed that he had helped Brandon off the floor, and Nissen said he was taking him back to jail. He said that the three of them left the house willingly in order for Brandon to make a phone call from the Stevenson Hotel. Then once he made the call, they drove out in the country north of Falls City, got stuck in a ditch, and got rescued by a farmer. Lauder didn't know exactly where they had been. Yeah, so he denied raping Brandon. He was told that an exam had been performed and that police had conclusive evidence that intercourse had happened. Lauder claimed to have no idea who might have had sex with Brandon. He said that neither he nor Nissen had sex with Brandon that night. Lauder was asked to take a polygraph exam, but he refused that, and he also objected to giving voluntary samples of his blood and hair. Actually, when those requests were made, Lauder became very irritated and said he didn't want to talk anymore, and he left the police station. Yeah, but Nissen talked more. Now, when he had been interviewed by police, they showed him a pair of rolled-up gray socks which had been collected from the scene at the meatpacking plant. Now, Nissen recognized them as the socks that had fallen from Brandon's underwear in the bathroom. Then, through Nissen, the police also learned that he and Lauder were drinking bush light that evening, which linked them to an empty beer can found alongside two used condoms at the site where the rape occurred. Yeah, so Nissen denied having sex with Brandon, saying it was Lauder who had intercourse with him. When asked to explain why two condoms were found at the crime scene, Nissen suggested that it was because Lauder couldn't keep an erection and maybe one of the condoms fell off of him and he had to replace it. Nissen said that he couldn't say for sure because he was alone in the front seat while Lauder and Brandon were undressing quietly in the back, as if this was consensual. And he denied turning around and looking to see what was going on back there. But he did admit that he heard Brandon say, don't hurt me, and it hurts, at least once. Now Nissen had offered to give his pubic hair and blood samples, and he had agreed to take a polygraph. 
so he promised to return for questioning the next day for a taped interview. Nissen then assured Lauder that he was trying to throw the cops off track, and he had no intention of cooperating. Yeah, but Lauder was getting nervous. Before dawn, the two of them were making plans how to take care of this problem. And unfortunately, Sheriff Lau made no effort to arrest them. It was his decision allowing them the time to plan and commit a multiple murder that in many ways is responsible for the three deaths that happened. Yeah, it wasn't Sheriff Lau's finest moment, was it? Well, I don't know if he had any fine moments, but it certainly wasn't his finest, no. On December 30th, Brandon was supposed to go to the police station for a follow-up interview. But when he arrived, he saw that Tom Nissen was there, and he was afraid to go in. So he called his mother, who begged him to come home. Brandon said, nah, everything's okay. I'll be there January 3rd. So Nissen and Lauder drove to Rulo, Nebraska, that same day to visit Nissen's mother. He told his mother that he wanted to give power of attorney to her, but he didn't say why. Then afterwards, they went to a local bar where they drank for a few hours. Bad decision. Well, Lauder decided that they needed better weapons to carry out their plan to kill Brandon. They went to Lauder's mother's house and got a pair of gloves and a knife. Then after that, they went to meet a guy named Eddie Bennett, who owned a gun. They didn't ask him for the gun, but they pretended they were just visiting him. And then Lauder snuck into Bennett's bedroom bureau while they were there and took the gun. So first they looked for Brandon at Lana's house. They knew that they might have to kill everyone there, but that was okay with them. They were determined that the murder had to be done. So yeah. these guys just aren't even thinking clearly. It's just some collateral damage here. Yeah, it's just crazy. So, but Brandon wasn't at Lana's house, and her mother told them to try Lisa Lambert's house. Yeah, she's really fucking helpful. Yeah, isn't she? <laughs> so... Lisa was hiding Brandon in her rented farmhouse. Lana would say later that John told her he felt like killing someone. He also said he was sorry and hoped that they didn't hate him. Now, Lana and her mother didn't know what he meant exactly, but at the same time, they never thought of calling Lisa or Brandon to warn them. Not at all. And, you know, there are some accounts of the story that say that Lana was in the car as they drove to the farmhouse. But Lana has denied this, and she was never charged with a crime. At 1 a.m. on December 31, 1993, Nissen and Lauder drove to Lisa Lambert's house, and they broke in. They found Lambert in bed and demanded to know where Brandon was. She refused to tell them, but Nissen searched and found Brandon under her bed. The men asked Lisa Lambert if there was anyone else in the house, and she said that yes, Philip Devine who was dating her sister Leslie at the time, was staying with her. So from the other bedroom, Philip Devine definitely could have heard Lisa screaming, and eight-month-old Tanner was crying next to her in his crib. Tanner's screams got louder, so Nissen picked him up, and Lisa just begged him, please don't hurt my baby. So Brandon was shot, and his body fell back on the bed with his knees hanging over the side. Lisa was frantic. Tom, why are you doing this? And really worried about her baby. She wanted her baby. Yeah, so Tom Neeson handed Tanner to Lisa. And then he noticed that Brandon's body was twitching a little bit. So somebody, Neeson or Lauder, one of the two, pulled out a knife and pulled Brandon toward him. And he stabbed Brandon repeatedly, uh, making sure he was dead. So poor Lisa has Tanner next to her chest, holding her hand around the baby, and one of the killers moved away from the bed while the other raised his arm with the gun and shot her in the stomach. So this was just a graze wound, but of course it was painful and she started to scream. Nissen asked Lisa to hand the baby back over to him, and she did it, and she watched him put her son back in the crib. But she's pleading for her baby's life. I mean, if you can imagine the terror here. Huh. I can't. And this was just a terrorizing moment that these guys weren't in there very long. And it was just a terrible crime, invasion and multiple murder. Yeah, Lauder was working on the sliding mechanism of the gun because it had jammed. 
He was trying to move the mechanism back and forth to get it to work again. Lauder went out of the room to get Philip. One of the killers shot Lisa in the eye, and then they shot Philip Devine on the living room couch as he was begging for his life. They left baby Tanner alive. So they were probably in that house no more than a few minutes, five or so. They drove into Kansas before returning to Nebraska. And that way, if they had been seen driving, they wouldn't be seen coming from Humboldt, but from the opposite direction. Very clever. Oh, yeah, they're geniuses. Yeah. They arrived back in Falls City in the middle of the night. Outside of the town, one of them threw a package which contained the gun, some clips, and the knife into the Namaha River, believing it would move downstream by the morning. Yeah, so not only are they evil, but they're idiots. They were wrong about that. The river was actually frozen. And the police easily found the gun and knife. And get this, the knife was in a sheath that had the name Lauder printed on it. Duh. I know, right? Jeez. So Nissen and Lauder went back to Nissen's house to sleep. They woke up Nissen's wife, but she didn't ask him any questions. Then they attempted to set up alibis by ordering Nissen's wife Candy and Lauder's girlfriend Rhonda to lie to police and say that they got home around one in the morning. Rhonda and Lauder slept on the living room floor. Nissen and Candy slept in the bedroom. Just around 10 o'clock in the morning, about the same time that everyone in the Nissen house was waking up, A volunteer member of the Humboldt Rescue Squad got a call from the Richardson County Sheriff's Office, and they were reporting deaths at the old farmhouse that Lisa Lambert was renting. Coroner Dr. Stephen Stripe received a call that morning, reporting that two women and a baby were killed at a farmhouse south of Humboldt. Of course, that wasn't correct. Deputy Ray Harrod radioed to say he was just 30 seconds behind them, and the ambulance should wait before approaching the crime scene, in case it's still dangerous. So Herod entered the house with his gun drawn, and immediately saw Philip Devine, who was a young African-American man, I think he was 22, leaning against a couch with an exit wound to the top right side of his head. Also an entrance wound to the jaw, and the coffee table was flipped over his legs. So then a rescue worker was brought in, touched the right side of Phil's neck to check for a pulse and found none. So Philip had been shot twice. He had come to Richardson County just a couple weeks earlier in mid-December to spend the holidays with his girlfriend, Leslie Tisdell. Remember, she's Lana's older sister. Yeah, they met at the Job Corps. Right. Now, I guess Leslie and Philip had had an argument, and that's why Phil was at the farmhouse without Leslie. But it had actually been Anna Mae Lambert, Lisa's mother and Tanner's grandmother, who had found this gruesome scene. She was sitting at the dining room table, feeding Tanner a bottle of formula, when the deputy and the ambulance squad arrived. She had arrived on the scene at 10.05 that morning, and she wasn't paying attention to the front door at first, so she didn't realize that the house had been broken into. She had knocked on the outside door, and then she had heard her grandson crying inside the house, so she entered. And when she got to the bedroom, she found Tanner, you know, wet and cold, with his eyes bloodshot from crying so much. And as she picked up Tanner, she saw that her daughter was lying on the bed, dead. Lisa had blood coming from her mouth, and there was also someone else on the bed that was Brandon. But at the time, Anna Mae couldn't tell if the person was a male or a female, and she didn't know who that was. So she grabbed the phone, which was on the floor next to the dresser, and called the Humboldt Police Department. Then after she hung up, she went into the kitchen, opened the refrigerator with a towel, and pulled out an open can of formula. She prepared a bottle, sat back down at the dining room table, and began feeding little Tanner. Yeah, so what do you make of her calmness in this (laughs) situation? She's pretty cool and collected, isn't she? Amazingly. Here's here's her daughter, who's been shot and killed. Two other bodies. Most people would be hysterical. Oh, no kidding. All I could think is she probably had a rough life too, and she was just a tough woman. So Dr. Stripe examined the baby. Tanner seemed to be in good condition, but it was determined that he should go to the hospital for evaluation. Well, of course. That's just standard, I would think. Yeah. So the shag carpet in Lisa's bedroom was wet with blood. Both bodies were soaked 
A bullet had punctured the waterbed, causing it to leak, so there is diluted blood all over the floor. Brandon was lying on his back crossways along the lower segment of the bed. He had on a sweatshirt and shorts. Lisa's body was partially under the covers. Her head was on a pillow. Her feet in pink socks were dangling over the edge. She had been shot three times. She had a superficial wound to her skin and subcutaneous tissue on the right side of her torso. She had two bullets fired into her brain, one through her right eye and one through her left ear. These shots had been made close enough to leave powder burns on her skin and hair. Yes, I just can't imagine what this Jeez. woman went through. This is horrendous. Isn't it? And she's just in her own bed and they shoot her to death. There is a small amount of blood on Brandon's abdomen, and he had a jagged wound on his hands, and under his chin was one small round hole, and it looked like there was gunpowder on the lower section of his face, chin, and neck. So this indicated that the killer had put the gun under his chin and pulled the trigger. His left jawbone was shattered, and the bullet had lodged in the base of his brain. Then there was a second bullet that had exited his skull, below his right ear. Either shot would have killed him instantly. His body could have been standing to the side of the bed when he was shot. He had a fracture on the left side of his skull, which indicated he had been hit on his head by some type of blunt object. He also had a stab wound, which had gone five inches into the right lobe of his liver. So if the bullets hadn't killed him, the knife wound would have. Right. So, of course, this is a senseless murder, but... You know, it's just kind of remarkable to me that they were okay with killing other people as well. Just killing these three people. And it's just, you know, a wonder to me. If that Tanner had been three or four years old, they would have killed him too. If he had been able to be a witness, yeah, they absolutely would have. Yeah, no, if he was older, they would have killed him too. Yes, yes. So good old Sheriff Lau, who had interviewed Brandon about the rape, arrived at the crime scene that morning. The bodies appeared to have been shot execution style, he said, and they didn't find any weapon in the house. It was Lau who identified the dead females as Lisa Lambert and Tina Brandon. The sheriff told the investigators that Tina Brandon was a female who had reported being raped on December 25, 1993, and there were two local suspects who were still under investigation. So Lau's charged with locating these suspects, who he really should have located <laughs> and arrested prior to this gruesome crime. He, he could have prevented it. He could have. So that afternoon, members of the police force were making arrangements to handle the arrests of Lauder and Nissen. They were going to be arrested for sexual assault and kidnapping. Charges had already been filed against Lauder and Nissen with the Falls City Police Department and the Richardson County Sheriff's Office on Christmas, December 25th, 1993. Right, so Brandon did the right thing, the brave thing, by reporting it and doing a rape kit and everything, and was treated poorly, and it wasn't followed up on correctly. Not even close. No. And it, and they lose part of his testimony that was taped. Yeah, lose it, in and, quotation marks. And they lose the rape kit. Right. Very suspicious. Of course. I mean, I almost feel like Lau thought it was okay what they did to her, the rape, which is a horrible thing to say, but I do kind of get that feeling when you listen to the audio. It wasn't a good interview. <laughs> no, no. So before the law enforcement had a briefing, someone from the Falls City Police Department had driven to the Nissen house and saw Lauder's car parked out front. Two deputies were positioned two houses away, to keep watch, and they watched as two officers knocked on the front door. Nissen came right out of the house and was put down on the ground at gunpoint. Then Lauder came out of the house and was positioned next to Nissen. So these two suspects were really close to each other, and they were trying to talk through what their stories were going to be, which made it very unsafe, so they were told to look away from each other and stop talking. Then within minutes, Nissen and Lauder were walked across the front lawn and taken into a police car. Now, Nissen was tried first, and this occurred in February of 1995. He had really seemed to enjoy the publicity that he got from the case, and he had given an interview to Playboy magazine in which he confessed to his part in Brandon's rape and the murders of Brandon, Lisa Lambert, 
and Philip Devine. He had also confessed to a fellow inmate. Both the Playboy journalist and the inmate were on the prosecution's witness list. Oh, I would think they were near the top of the list. Can you imagine? I mean, I know he had a court-appointed lawyer, but (laughs) you're trying to do your best to get this guy, if not off, at least... The best you can get for him, right? The best deal you can do. Sure. And here this jerk is talking to a magazine journalist, and he's also confessed to a fellow inmate. He's screwed. Oh, I would definitely recommend reading that article. It's still available online, and it's just ridiculous. So Nissen was convicted of first-degree murder in the killing of Tina Brandon and two counts of second-degree murder for Lisa Lambert and Philip Devine. Now, he was still facing the possibility of the death penalty, but his final sentencing was going to be delayed until after Lauder's trial. Right, and Lauder's trial began in May. The prosecution said in their opening statement that Lauder wanted Brandon dead because he was afraid Brandon would testify against him for the rape and he didn't want to go to prison. Makes sense. It does. The police provided testimony about finding the gun and knife, the pair of gloves, and the sheath with the Lauder name on it, just south of Falls River, and the gun was proven to be the one used in the killings. Also, there was blood that was of the same type as Brandon's on the knife blade. Yeah, and don't forget the sheath had Lauder's name on it. Right, that's the big one. You might as well leave a card. Yes. So the defense had a psychiatrist testify that Lauder was mentally impaired and might have been unable to differentiate right from wrong. On cross-examination, however, the psychiatrist had to acknowledge that throwing the murder weapons into the river showed that Lauder knew what he was doing had been wrong. Yeah, I mean, his IQ was on the lower side, but I really kind of think that's irrelevant. Lauder's girlfriend, Rhonda, testified that Lauder had been threatening to kill Brandon because they felt like he had tricked them. She also revoked the alibi she had given him, and she admitted that He and Nissen had not arrived at her house on the night of the murders until about 3.30 in the morning, not 1 a.m. Well, that's not going to help him. No. So Nissen took the stand in Lauder's trial after he made a deal with the prosecution. For agreeing to tell the truth about what had happened on the night of the murders, nothing Nissen said on that day would be used against him. And more importantly, the death penalty was off the table for Nissen because he testified. So he did testify that he and Lauder had committed the murders together. He said that they had plotted to kill kill Brandon for six full days before they went through with it. They had gone to look for Brandon on December 26th with plans to lure him to an isolated area where they planned to chop off his head and hands. I know. So when they couldn't find Brandon that night, they sat around getting drunk and really got obsessed about killing Brandon. Lauder had said that a dead witness could not testify, so killing Brandon was the only way to save themselves from a long prison term. Nissen then admitted that he had stabbed Brandon, but he claimed that it was Lauder who shot all three of the victims. After that, Lauder decided he wanted to testify in his own defense, because he was pretty upset with this testimony, and he went ahead and did it against his attorney's advice. He testified that he never planned to murder Brandon, that he never shot him, and that he never shot Lisa or Philip either. Lauder called Tom Nissen a liar, and he complained that he'd been sitting in prison for something he had not done. He was just a victim of circumstance, and he completely denied Nissen's account of the murders. But then he was caught lying because he was contradicting the testimonies of other, more credible witnesses. So... Like his attorney had told him, it was really a mistake to testify. Certainly didn't help him. Not at all. So he was convicted of three counts of first-degree murder, three counts of using a deadly weapon, and one count of burglary. The prosecution was seeking the death penalty. Now, once the verdict was in, Leiter's case was automatically up for appeal. And by then, Nissen's appeal was already in review. Now, under the terms of Nissen's plea agreement, he had been sentenced to serve three consecutive life sentences, which gave him no chance for parole for at least 27 years, and his appeal was denied. Then there was a two-week slot scheduled for Lauder's sentencing. A three-judge panel sat in the Richardson County Courthouse as Lauder's attorney presented 
mitigating circumstances in his case. So despite his mother and some others testifying to his good character, he received the death penalty. And he immediately began to fight his conviction. He claimed that, contrary to what Nissen had said, Nissen had been the shooter. And he claimed to have proof. So according to Lauder, DNA testing on gloves, shoes, and the clothing worn by Nissen on the night of the murders could exonerate him. He said that blood would be found that would show a pattern from high-velocity spatter, which would be consistent with Nissen being the shooter. But in 2001, Lauder petitioned to order the DNA testing under the Nebraska DNA Testing Act. But prosecutors pointed out that Lauder could have requested the testing during his 1995 trial, but he hadn't done that. And I guess this testing wasn't available in 1995, wasn't really available until 1997 because the state didn't recognize DNA evidence as legally admissible until then. Also, Lauder had not known until his trial that Nissen was going to testify against him, so he hadn't seen any need for the testing. But in response to that, the state brought up the other evidence against Lauder, including his theft of the gun, the knife, and the gloves used in the murders. Also, his creation of a false alibi with his girlfriend, and also him being overheard saying that he wanted to kill someone. So because of that, his petition was rejected, noting that the DNA testing would not show how the blood had gotten on the clothing, I mean the spatter, would only show that Nissen was near the victims when they were shot. It wouldn't prove that he had pulled the trigger. So the petition went to the Nebraska Supreme Court in 2003, where it was decided that he wouldn't get a new trial and his death sentence would not be commuted to life in prison. You know, Nissen had escaped the death penalty because he testified against Lauder. Years later, though, in 2007, he recanted his testimony against Lauder. Nissen then claimed that it was he who shot and stabbed Brandon, and it was he who shot and killed Lisa Lambert and Philip Devine, so there wouldn't be any of the witnesses. He said that the crimes had been his idea, and Lauder had gone along to help. In addition to Nissen's statement, four of his former cellmates said that Nissen confessed to the killings. Yeah, but just because Nissen had changed his story didn't make his new story the true story. And he can't be retried or resentenced. So at this point, he really had nothing to lose by taking responsibility after the fact. And anyway, Nissen still maintained that Lauder was with him that night, and by Nebraska law, this would make Lauder equally culpable, regardless of who shot the gun. Joanne Brandon sued Sheriff Charles Lowe and Richardson County for the wrongful death of Brandon. The complaint charged that negligence and mishandling of the rape case had led to Brandon's murder. Lowe had prevented his deputies from arresting Lauder and Neeson, and Lowe claimed that he was just trying to not jump the gun. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to jump the gun. What the hell does that mean? A lower court dismissed the lawsuit, but the Nebraska Supreme Court reinstated it because Lowe had told Lauder and Nissen about the complaint made by Brandon, but he had done nothing to protect Brandon. Right, so that's a good point there. That's really important to think about. Brandon had gone in, made this complaint, and then they'd gone ahead and interviewed the two people who did it, but not arrested them. So Brandon's just like a sitting duck for them. Yeah, now the lower court agreed, but they determined that only 15% of the fault was with the county. So Joanne was only awarded $17,000. Which seems like a kick in the teeth. Then the Nebraska Supreme Court reversed the award reduction and increased the amount to $80,000 for mental suffering plus money for funeral expenses, wrongful death, and emotional distress. Yeah, how do you feel about that? Well, that's still chicken feed. Well, yeah, I mean, no amount of money is going to help, really. But it's really not enough money for the county to feel the pain. No, it isn't. And uh, they, they ought to charge the sheriff with something. I don't know. Well, you know, you would think that he would at least have been fired. So it was in 1999 when Brandon's life was the topic of the film Boys Don't Cry. Hilary Swank starred as Brandon, 
and she actually won the Oscar for Best Actress. Joanne Brandon, his mother, publicly objected to Swank's referring to Brandon as a man and calling him Brandon Tina instead of his given name, Tina Brandon, when Swank gave her acceptance speech. So certainly this was an issue for Joanne. She did not want her daughter referred to as a man, even though that seems like what Brandon definitely wanted. Right. Lana Tisdale sued the movie's distribution company for portraying her as lazy white trash and claimed that the film falsely portrayed her relationship with Brandon. So a settlement was made for an undisclosed amount of money. There's certainly a lot of social issues that get brought up for this, from this case. One is the elevated number of violent crimes against transgender people. Now, a study released by the National Coalition of Anti-Violence found that anti-gay incidents had decreased slightly in the 90s, but the number of transgender victims of hate crimes increased up to 49%. The Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act, also known as the Matthew Shepard Act, is an American act of Congress that was passed on October 22, 2009. It was developed in response to the murders of Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr., who both were killed in 1998. So the law expands the 1969 United States federal hate crime law to include crimes motivated by a victim's actual or perceived gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. You know, and that is a big part of getting justice in these cases. But it's still going on, especially African-American transgender males transitioning to women have been victims of a lot of violent crime. Certainly have. And, of course, they're hate crimes. Now, the bill also removes, in the case of hate crimes related to race, color, religion, or national origin of the victim, the prerequisite that the victim be engaging in a federally protected like activity, like voting or going to school. So that's out. Yeah. Gives federal authorities greater ability to engage in hate crime investigations, even if the local authorities choose not to pursue them. That's important. You could see that making a difference in this case. In, in this instance. Sure. Right? And it requires the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, to track statistics on hate crimes based on gender and gender identity. Statistics for the other groups were already being tracked. Exactly. In 2018, advocates tracked at least 26 deaths of transgender or gender nonconforming people in the U.S. due to fatal violence. And like I said, the majority of these people were black transgender women. These victims were killed by acquaintances, partners, and strangers. Some of these cases involve clear anti-transgender bias. And in others, the victim's transgender status may have put them at risk in other ways that you really might not think about like forcing them into unemployment and poverty, homelessness, or getting involved in sex work. We know now that fatal violence disproportionately affects transgender women of color. The reporting of anti-transgender violence is underreported because many of these victims are described as the wrong gender in the police statements and media reports, so we don't even know. And I think of myself as fairly educated, but I really have to admit that I had some uncertainty about the terms. I think a lot of us are ignorant about this, unless it's in your life. So transgender describes a person born as one gender but living as another. And this person may be pre- or post-operative transsexual. A transsexual describes a person who's undergone sex reassignment surgery. And gender identity is the gender that the person considers his or herself to be, regardless of their physical appearance or their sexual orientation. Yeah, now, Brandon's case is further complicated by the fact that he was a victim of childhood sexual abuse and incest. There have been some studies that confirm gender dysphoria has been identified as a response to child sexual abuse. And many of Brandon's behaviors also were consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, so it's a tough area there because many people do see the issue of Brandon's gender identity being related to his childhood abuse as being transphobic. Brandon did voice some ambivalence about getting gender-affirming surgery, 
but he also voiced discomfort with his female body, and he did choose to identify as a male. It's just really sad that Brandon wasn't able to get the therapy to help him figure out what was going on and if he actually did want to have surgery. And also at the time, he wouldn't have been able to afford it. So I know in many ways he wasn't a sympathetic character because of the dishonesty, the thefts, and his pattern of moving from one relationship to another, sometimes not showing a lot of concern for these girls' feelings. But he has been described by the girls he dated as a real gentleman and as a very giving person. And much of these problems could have been due to his need for approval. But Brandon's out-of-control life can be pretty easily understood, and I think a lot of the imperfections can be forgiven when we consider the issues that he had to face as a young person. And of course, no one deserves the violence that was done to him. Well, that's the bottom line. Right, right. right. But when it comes down to it, Brandon never got the chance to mature and even figure out his identity. His life was cut short by these two ignorant, homophobic, violent men. So we have several sources for this episode. Aphrodite Jones wrote an excellent book titled All He Ever Wanted. There's an article in the 2018 Journal of the American Medical Association titled Trends in Gender Affirming Surgery Among Transgender Patients in the United States. Trivia, Voices of Feminism by Carolyn Gage. Death of a Deceiver by Eric Konigsberg. Playboy, 1995. The Humboldt Murders by John Gregory Dunn. New Yorker Magazine, January 13, 1997. The John Lauder Murderpedia page, Brandon Tina's story, a 1998 documentary. A lot of sources. There's a lot. Well, once again, TCB's music was written and produced by Tristan Capel. Now, I just have a few housekeeping notes from the Tie Grabber office before we get to feedback. I wanted to remind our listeners that we've brought back a contest, which was very popular when we had it a few years ago. This is our beer review contest. We're going to run this contest probably till the end of April. All you need to do is record yourself reviewing one of your favorite beers, just as Dick does in the beginning of each of our shows. And the submissions will be judged on personality, detail, and just the overall charm of the review. Audio quality won't be judged, so don't worry if you don't have recording equipment. Just a simple voicemail or voice memo recording will do perfectly. And the prize for this is going to be a pair of my favorite Bluetooth earbuds, which are actually waterproof, and you can wear them when you exercise. They're just really awesome. So we really look forward to hearing your beer reviews, and of course, we're going to play the winner on a future episode. We are. We've had several submissions already. I I love them. It's going to be a difficult task to determine which one is going to be the winner, but we'll keep trying. Great. Also, if you happen to decide that you're interested in getting some more TCB episodes in your life and giving us a little support, you can join Team Tie Grabber. Our commercial-free members-only episodes come out every month, plus there's a backlog of about 40 episodes that are yours to listen to as soon as you become a member. And when you sign up and go on our website, you're given your own personal URL so you can actually add the show, the True Crime Brewery Premium Show as we call it, to your podcast app. And if you have any trouble doing that, just write to me and I will explain it to you. It's very simple. You can be a Tie Grabber member for as little as $4 a month. And also when you join, you get to choose a welcome gift, which we'll send to you with a nice handwritten thank you note. So if you're at all interested, just go to tiegrabber.com and click on subscribe and you can learn more about that. We're moving on to feedback, and if you have a case suggestion or comments about a crime or even a beer, we encourage you to send us a voicemail. We have a widget on our website, which you can see on the right side of your screen, and you can click on that and record your message on whatever device you're using. Just make sure your microphone's on. So if you're too shy to send us a voicemail, we also would love to get an email with your comments or suggestions. You can send that to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. Okay, we have some emails and voicemails case suggestions. First is a voicemail from Imogen. Hi there, Jim and Dick. Um, my name's Imogen. I've just received my amazing little gifts from you guys today for being a subscriber. Um, and I'm really touched. There's such a sweet little 
a personalized card from Jill in there. And um, I love the snifter. I'm a huge fan of beer, so I'll be drinking my beers from there from now on. I've got a case suggestion for you as well. Uh, it's a British one, obviously, as you can probably tell I'm English. And it's the disappearance of, well, disappearance and, and murder of Tia Sharp, who was a, uh, a 12-year-old girl who was reported missing. And it was a, it was very, very big in the news at the time. And for a week, there were appeals to find her. And it was, you know, obviously treated very much as a missing person's case. And then she was found in her grandmother's house in the loft, dead. Um, and it turned out she'd been killed by her grandmother's boyfriend. He's, you know, quite a, a character. He initially was in a relationship with the mother for a couple of weeks, and then he ended up in a relationship with the grandmother. And he had, you know, quite a, a harrowing past. There are some resources on it. There's a, sort of a BBC profile. There's a book as well called Tia Sharp, A Family Betrayal. I think it's, although it's quite a sad case, I think it's a really interesting one. And one you can get into quite a lot of, of depth and kind of, you know, raises those important questions around family and, and who you should trust around your children, really. I'd like to make a suggestion for a beer as well, because the last time, the last time you did an English case, I, or the last one that I listened to anyway, you did Carling, which, oh man, no one drinks that, or they do, but only, you know, <laughs> people who are very sad <laughs> with their lives. Um, I don't mean that, but we have some fantastic beers. The one in particular, I don't know if you'd be able to get hold of it, uh, but there's a brewery in Bermondsey in London, the Colonel, and they make the best IPA I have ever had in my life. Uh, it's not a typical English IPA at all. Throw all of your preconceptions about English beer out of the window. The Colonel IPA Citra is incredible. So if you can find that, if you can get hold of it, I'd strongly recommend it. I think uh, both of you, Jill and Dick, would, would really enjoy that one. Thank you so much again for my little gifts. I'm really, really happy with them and keep up the great work. I love listening to your podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Imogen. So you have a lovely accent, which we enjoy listening to and good recommendation too. Yeah, it is. I think there's plenty of sources for this. I think it's been a while since we've done an English case, if I'm not wrong it, about that. It has that. been. Yeah. No, it's been a while. And I knew Carling was not a great beer. <laughs> But in my defense, it wasn't an English case. I think it was a South African or some other country, not England, where I, I picked Carling. Oh, so it's not an English beer? No. Oh, okay. So what about the beer that Imogen was talking about? Well, I haven't ever tried it, but okay. it sounds delicious. <laughs> Imogen sounds like a, a good beer drinker, and I would take her word for enjoying that beer. So I'll look for that to go along with our case. All right. And I think that we will write down the Tia Sharp case as something to do in the near future. Done. All right. So well, next we have an email. One's from Cindy uh, with a case suggestion. And Cindy is uh, usually very succinct, and she is this time too. She says, Barbara Stager, who killed both her husbands, currently reading the book Before He Wakes by author's last name Bledsoe. So Russ Stager died in 1988. <laughs> He kept a gun under his pillow, and his wife Barbara said that she must have accidentally pulled the trigger while the couple slept. You told me about that, and I, I called bullshit immediately. No kidding. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess you work with what you got, and that's, that's the best you could come up with. Yeah. Initially, actually, the shooting was ruled an accident, but she was eventually charged and convicted of his murder. So that was one thing. And then we find out and I don't think she's been charged, but Barbara's first husband died under very similar circumstances. Well, what would be very similar? Well, I, he was shot. I don't think it was a gun under the pillow. Okay. But I'll check. That's probably not a good place to keep a gun anyway. I wouldn't think. Especially with the safety off, which must have been there. She accidentally turned the safety well, off first. Yeah, turned the safety <laughs> I off I accidentally first. loaded it, turned the safety off. I did all these things on accident. Those. Yeah. It just happened. All right. Well, that's a great recommendation. Thanks, Cindy. And then we have a case suggestion from Chad. Chad writes, I love your podcasts. You have covered so many of the famous crime cases and do a great job. What I would love to see you cover is labeled as the mainline murders that occurred in 1979, not far from me in Philadelphia. I know you have done one with that name before, but this is the real one. 
It was the subject of author Joseph Wamba's best-selling book entitled Echoes in the Darkness, and was followed by a TV miniseries in 1987 under the same name. Two other books, Engaged to Murder, The Inside Story of the Mainline Murders by Loretta Schwartz Nobel, and Principal Suspect by William Kostopoulos, detail this crime as well. Now, I remember that we actually got quite a bit of mail about this when we did our version of the Mainline Murders, that this one is actually more well-known It is, with that and we've toyed with looking at it because I remember the name, Susan Reinert is the lady who was killed, and her two children, they they all disappeared in 1979. People found Reinert's naked, beaten body in the trunk of her car. Her children's bodies have never been recovered. But this is this whole sordid story. She taught at some Tony school in the Philadelphia area, and turns out that she was seeing and engaged to a fellow teacher, and there was this uh, principal who everybody at the school called the Prince of Darkness. All right, don't give away the ending. And these two people were charged and convicted of her murder. That's the ending. You just gave away the ending. I didn't. Okay. Well, also, Chad went on to write, I normally would never email or contact a person to suggest something, but I am telling you, this is one of the most bizarre and fascinating cases of the 20th century. You are really missing out by not covering this case, and I'd give half a pinky to hear Jill and Dick's opinion as to who is innocent and who is guilty. So thanks, Chad. That's a great recommendation. Yeah, we won't make you give up half a pinky. Although, you know, pinky finger, pinky toe, you probably wouldn't miss them. <laughs> well, not a lot, but we certainly wouldn't take it, would we? No, we wouldn't think of no, doing that. No, we don't do that. And the interesting thing, because I am a big Joseph Wambaugh fan, so we have this book already, Echoes in the Darkness. Oh, all right. So it's just ready for us to sit down and read it and start doing the episode. Well, great. Okay. Sure. All right. Thanks, Chad. All right. So let's wrap things up. We're going to go back to the non-existent quiet end right now because we're quarantined. I have to say it because I always do. So we'll see everyone at the quiet end next week. Next week. Be there. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye.